Hey, I'm Scott, the cranky old filmmaker. You know what they say, life's a journey. And when the going gets tough, it's nice to have friends to share it with. And man, have I had my share. From failure to loss, collapse to grief, I've pretty much seen it all. But you know what? I'm still here and I'm not done yet. So grab a front row seat, some popcorn, and you might even need a tissue. And let's cranky it up as we delve into stories about some of life's most challenging moments personally and professionally on the Cranky Old Filmmaker Show podcast. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining me today for another episode of the Cranky Old Filmmaker Show podcast. I'm out of the studio today and up here in beautiful Edmonds, Washington, a little bit cold, and I have a treat for you today, a history lesson, a passionate remembrance of the golden age of fashion retailing. You see, I'm working on a documentary about the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier, Evans Furs. It's a topic I know pretty well since I worked 20 years for the company that my great uncles began in 1929 and was a victim of changing times, tastes, and culture, which combined with some operational blunders led to their demise 70 years later in 1999. Anyways, in doing interviews for this documentary, I've come across some gems interviews of which only a portion will be used in the actual documentary. But with so much rich information and reflections, I wanted to share this one in particular, my discussion with Robert Sackowitz, former CEO of Sackowitz Department Stores out of Houston, Texas, who had stores all over the Southwest until they too closed in the 1990s. On the heels of a book he has in production entitled More Than a Store, Mr. Sackowitz spent some time reschooling me about fashion retailing, his relationship with Evans Furs, which is the subject of my documentary, as I mentioned. And I, I just thought this all should be shared with you for both posterity and historical sake. And while both of these retail titan stories end in tragic demise, their rise to the top, their partnership, their goodwill to their communities and their combined industry innovations help both companies. So why don't I let him tell the stories, grab some popcorn, a drink, sit down and enjoy this magnificent conversation between myself and Mr. Robert Sackowitz from April 2024. So first, um, Mr. Robert Sackowitz, tell us a little bit about the history of yourself and your store and your family and and, and how much time how much time do you have? Well, let's do the let's do the let's do the short version. Short version, my great grandfather came to Ellis Island in uh, 1886 from uh, uh, conscription in Russia with his eldest son leaving the rest of his family uh, about 20 miles south of Kiev. But by that time, you know, back then it was Russia. Um, the Russians didn't even like the Ukrainians then, much less uh, much less Jews. And so uh, they were going to be conscripted. They knew her, they were cannon fodder. So he left, left his wife and two other infant boys, small boys, uh, and a girl, and came into the port of entry in New York. Um, they couldn't read Cyrillic Russian. So Tchaikovich, which... Cyrillic Russian looks like an S, I guess, and an AK, and an O, and a W, and Ch at the end, Chekovich, Chi, looks like an upside down question mark. So they said, ah, it's ITZ. So they created our name as Sakowitz. Um, and uh, he couldn't get work in New York. There was a group from Galveston, Texas, which was at that time in 1886, um, second only to New Orleans as a port. And the most important Wall Street of uh, of the Gulf at the time. All the shipping, it was a great port, cotton, cattle, co- uh, uh, all kinds of uh, rice, all kinds of produce. And um, got a job there peddling, needless to say, as a lot of us did. Uh, made enough money to then send for the rest of his family. And that's how my grandfather came. He was the second son. Uh, he and his uh, and his younger brother, ultimately, there were no child labor laws, so they start working immediately, about 12 years old, something like that, by the time they were 10 or 12. And uh, the mother saved some money and uh, 
at the ages of uh, 21 and 19, respectively, my my grandfather, uh, the elder one, um, they started a little uh, gentleman's haberdashery, which back then was uh, collars and cuffs and ties and that, that sort of thing. In Galveston, um, fast forward, uh, Houston was growing. Galveston had another grand hurricane. The great hurricane of 1900 is still the largest natural disaster in American history. Uh, 8,000 to 10,000 people perished. Um, they built a seawall and tried to come back. Uh, 1915, another great storm came. Wasn't as bad because they had the seawall as far as lives lost. But commercially, that was it. So my grandfather uh, and great uncle moved up to Houston and expanded with Houston as Houston grew. The port of Houston started in the ship channel, the Houston ship channel opened in 1914. And Houston was thriving. World War I, World War II, um, it became an industrial capital. And we grew with it. Uh, we started only in men's and then men's and boys. And then, uh, too long a story, so I won't say it, but Jesse Jones, who had been head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation with FDR, uh, was head of the War Industries Board, was from Houston. And he was kind of Mr. Houston, wanted everything to grow on Main Street, told my grandfather, I'm going to build a store on Main Street to nail down. We're going to build Houston north-south, not east-west, the way some other people want to. And... Uh, you're going to take the first five floors. And my grandfather almost fell over. He said, how am I going to do that? He said, look, I'll pay for the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. You go lease out to other people, lease out a woman's department. You know, that's the way it was done back then. So lease out uh, uh, a millinery and a shoe and women's apparel. And <clears throat> so they did. And they opened a store uh, on Main and Rusk in the Gulf building, five floors, Sackwood's brothers. Um, it was immediately successful. They did all these women's, men's, children's, but under the Sackwood's name. And continued to grow. Uh, in 1949, uh, it was growing so much, and Houston was growing so much, they wanted to really build a wonderful new store. And so uh, expanded and take over all those lease departments and run them themselves. So they did. Well, can I, can I interrupt you a second? So was this the net, the, the lease department thing was the natural trend for stores like this? And then was there a trend back to, 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 uh, you, re, to retaking you, if, the ownership of them? If you, well, there wasn't a trend to necessarily take them back, but they realized that it would be more profitable if they could do that okay. um, and wanted to expand and do it on their own. Um. As far as your first question, was that the trend? If you go to Europe, even today, lesser to lesser degree, um, go to China, uh, Asia, most of the stores would lease out space. It was just a vertical mall, but they'd lease out space to manufacturers. So that even when I was an intern at Galerie Lafayette, after I graduated from college and went to work in Paris, they were still leasing space for manufacturers, giving them the equivalent of stores within a store. And that was the manner in which it actually worked as a European system. John Wanamaker and several others were the first to buy merchandise on their own account instead of leasing. So if you bought the merchant on merchandise on your own account, you made the gross margin <laughs> instead of just getting lease payments. Okay. So that's what they did. Um, I don't recall in 51 um, who, I remember his name was Lowen, George Lowen, spoke with a uh, uh, Slavic language uh, accent. Um, I don't know whether we had leased the furs or whether the fur department or whether um, 
he um he was an employee so i can't remember in 51 whether we actually started like that so i also don't remember exactly when um we turned the lease over to evans uh perhaps there's something in the documentation that you can find but i i don't know what date it was um but this is in the grand this is in the grand time like the 50s to the late 70s is the grand time of retailing especially it was at evans so like, like your business is exploding at this time as well yes and this yes this is 51 and houston was growing you have to understand in i believe in 1950 if i'm not mistaken the population was like 250,000 1960 it was 550,000 in 1970 it was a million one I mean it doubled every 10 years yeah. Houston just kept being uh, the growth uh, leader and um so I do know I mean I do remember um a lot of relationships because my father had his first heart attack in 1965 at the age of 58 and as he's coming out of the ER he's got tubes in his mouth and tubes up his nose and he's ashen gray and I'm holding his hand and uh he said I'm going to feed you with a fire hose because I want you to make as many mistakes as possible while I'm still alive to try and help and by the next year I mean it was like throwing me in the ocean sink or swim um I was executive vice president, general merchandise manager of the company, age 27. So I do remember an awful lot of the merchandising, um, launching a lot of European goods uh, because of a little bit of my experience. And Neiman Marcus had the lock on all the women's specialty designers. And back then they were all exclusives. Um, we couldn't get those exclusives because we weren't hadn't been in the women's business had this long standing relationship so we had uh some of the los angeles designers the hollywood designers helen rose and jean louis but the french have a great expression on cherche le creno look for the crack and then drive a wedge in it um european couture was always couture but they didn't have uh uh, their own ready to wear it was called confection and basically the top designers over there would sell a model to maria corinne or mendez who would then have the rights to reproduce that as ready to wear and they were the manufacturers so uh, i heard about that uh, when i had been working there uh, i flew over uh, in the mid-60s uh right at this time when i was executive vice president flew over and i said let me let me see if maybe we can use the european designer names and have an up on neiman's that way or at least be competitive more competitive by having some great fashion names well of course one of the challenges is that the fit was different so it's not quite like the fur industry um it really depends upon the uh, the way in which the body is formed by each manufacturer all the specifications european women back then uh compared to the american women were uh slightly uh narrower shouldered uh not as smaller busted bigger hipped and shorter from the nape of the neck to the waist this is more than you want to know, but it just it's basically. You know, I'm a student of this, so this is great. Yes. So we saw that differential that it just didn't fit that well. I mean, I remember hearing one of my uh, uh, top salespeople talking to a, a lady coming in, and I'm writing a book, and this is in this book, incidentally. The book is called More Than a Store, and it's the three decades of the 60s 70s and 80s awesome. the era of those stores where there's colossal fashion change uh social mores changes uh the civil rights uh vietnam war <clears throat> changes in the economy opec all of this happens from 1960 to 1990 and those are my store years actually 
So there are a series of vignettes, one of which includes a trip to Leningrad, about which I will tell you in a moment, with David and his wife. What was her name again? Sharon. Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. Right. So I've got a great photograph of Sharon sitting in one of the furs uh, and David sitting behind and me sort of sitting on the, because they're steps. And they're the steps to the Hermitage Museum where we were photographing uh, for our, for our uh, Christmas catalog shots, some of the furs we were buying. Um, and it's a, it's a great photograph. Anyhow, uh, so I, I don't remember exactly when we started, but I do remember being involved a little bit in the fur business and meeting David and being with him. I remember a trip to Chicago that was probably, I think, on, on record, um, the worst snowstorm that Chicago held. It, it must have been in the 70s. Um, I, I don't remember when, either the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but there was snow up to the top of the cars that were parked on the street. It was that bad a snowstorm. It was unbelievable. Anyway, um, I, I remember, uh, you know, socializing with, uh, with Sharon and David, and I remember uh, us being in business and meeting all the people uh, at the company. And we had a very nice business um, in Houston because people traveled, and uh, they uh, knew that uh, a good fur coat was a great symbol of uh, success. So I also happened to have a, we started a, a pension for starting new things and experimenting just as I had launched Courage, Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, all those people, I did their pret-à-porter, they're ready to wear, and launched them in the United States, not just Houston or North Texas, in the U.S. Um, and there, those are, each one has a story, but that became extremely successful. Um, and with those fashion leaders, I could get other people now from New York wanting for Sackwitz to sell them because if we had these other big fashion leaders, then clearly um, they would be willing to put their merchandise with us instead of just Neiman. So we became quite competitive. <clears throat> One of the things uh, that we used as a promotional tool in the beginning, but then as an actual business, was, as I'm fond of saying, long before the internet, there were catalogs. And the golden age of catalogs was in this period of roughly 1970 to 1990. 95 and we became extremely competitive with neiman marcus they would have his and hers and i came up with this idea to have themes instead a theme of three four five ten different ways to express that theme so the gift of knowledge because this came from people coming up to me and saying i want something that's really different robert I want something that's unique in all the world for my, my husband or my, my wife. Okay, what do we do? So it had to be the ultimate gift. And that's what we call these, the ultimate gift. Whereas Neiman's was his and hers, ours were the ultimate gifts. And the ultimate gifts, uh, for instance, the gift of knowledge was lessons um, in skiing with Jean-Claude Keeley. Lessons in how to bust a Bronco with Larry May in World Championship Rodeo. Lessons in how to dance from Mitzi Gaynor. Lessons um, in economics from Elliot Janeway. Lessons in conversation with Truman Capote. Lessons in just about anything with George Plimpton. And these were all things we got prices from their agent, and we put them in the book and sold a number of them. Well, one of the things that I fashioned upon because one of our customers uh, had just, they were always looking for something different. And I said to David, 
what's the most expensive fur in the world that would be totally unique? And he said, clearly, Robert, it's a Russian crown borgazine sable and only available, you know, in Russia. I said, well, how do they grade them? How do you, how do you know? Is there a such thing as a best? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, you know, they go through, they grade them. There's top of the line, their skins and da, da, da. He said, but I'm not going to take a chance to go over there. And I mean, that's too much risk. Said, okay, what if I can pre sell it beforehand? Said, you get it pre sold, we're going to Leningrad together. So I got one of my uh, oil friends who had a beautiful wife, model statuesque, and he said, I'll do it. Absolutely. John Meekham wanted to do it for his wife, Cassie. So I said, okay, we're going to want to put it in our Christmas book. So let us, you know, try and sell it. But if we don't sell it at that price, there'll be a fallback price that I'll work with you where we at least cover our cost a little and you guarantee to buy it. With that agreement, we set out for Leningrad. And I've forgotten the name of... I think it started with an L, Leonard. What was his name? Don't remember. Um, mm -hmm. Probably before my time. Okay. Anyhow, we went over. That in itself is a lengthy story. As I said, it's in the book. It's one of the vignettes. But we spent three or four days in Leningrad at the auctions. And, I mean, we literally saw the bugs up uh, in the ceiling so we knew we were being spied on because if they knew what we were buying, they'd shill someone to be able to up the bids all the time because that's what the Russians were doing. They were trying to get as much dollars as possible. So we used to go out in the snow, literally outside like Gorky Park, and talk about which numbers and the bidding. I've still got the book, as a matter of fact, uh, the... the uh, the Soyuz Pushnina uh, catalog. And the problem was that it was to be a full length or what's called opera length coat. Well, the bundles were numbered and put together in such a way that that was enough for a regular dress length coat, you know, top of the knee. If it was going to be opera length, we'd have to buy two bundles. And not only buy two bundles, but one had to be lighter than the other in weight so that the sweep and the bottom would be wider and would also drape properly on the body. But it also had to be matching perfectly so that when they were let out, all the cuts, they could be put together and end up with a uniform look. We went through and we'd go through and grade, and I learned more about the fur business in those three days than anybody ever could. I mean, you know, with other, other, with, with other circumstances. And uh, we'd go back and David and I, I mean, we'd all talk at night. We'd sit at dinner by ourselves and go out. Long story short, we bought the top bundle of skins to them to match plus some other lesser sables lesser only than the top but they were gorgeous and the only other thing that russia has that's totally unique compared to as you know from gorky park of sables is russian lynx because lush russian lynx because of the weather because of the inbreeding whatever um is far more luxurious than canadian lynx Canadian lynx is good, but Russian lynx is better. So we bought the top bundle that we could find of Russian lynx as well. Let me let me ask you, um, because Zoom may cut us off. I may have to beg you for another session. But so when did you start to see a shift in things? You know, in the fur industry, it was, in my opinion, a combination of um, 
the mass production and cheapening the product to make it available to everybody combined with the anti-fur movement which then affected the demand but in the in the in the non-fur business in the retail and ready to wear business when did you start to signal the shift and then did, was it uh, parallel to what you saw happening in the fur business well in the fur business PETA, PETA had a lot to do with it you know the people against the fur uh uh use of furs and pelts and animals all that um ours was also the fur business began to, to drop off in our part of the world when the economy shifted we boomed in the 70s with opec and everything all of the oil producing states texas being the biggest among them um oklahoma new mexico to some degree california uh were really favorably impacted and people had a lot of money they bought furs they bought couture they bought when opec basically crashed oil dropped from 49.75 a barrel it's high to august of 1985 eight dollars a barrel and the economy was destroyed because it wouldn't come back and <clears throat> more banks and commercial real estate and businesses went under than any other place or at any other time even more than the depression as far as texas was concerned uh, the depression of 1929 30 30 you know, 32. um so we had to file for a restructuring in chapter 11. um we were able to come out of it with a, a partner from uh, australia who bought bonwit teller and b altman um but then the flash crash came along in 1987 88 89 and new york and wall street were really hurt by that so that there was a recession in 92 in the in the in the ni early 90s as well and when people don't have that kind of disposable income and they're worried about paying the rent they sure as hell ain't thinking about buying fur so the combination of changes in the economy changes in social mores changes basically in our culture really put a damper on the entire fur industry and uh you know when the 11 came along david was was very trying to assist us um wanted to stay in business they created a separate little area of their own and uh right near us uh, we were fighting for our lives and of course jerry gronauer was running that for evans yep i remember him well yeah um and uh that that was the demise of the evans relationship with 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 Sackwoods. So we restructured, we came back in, but then it it didn't uh Evans didn't want to take the chance of the of that risk. Jerry then left them to run our fur departments. He, so he left being the manager of Evans Furs to stay with Sackwoods as manager of the Sackwoods Furs on our uh reorg period. Well, so even at that point you didn't abandon it. I'm sorry? Even at that point you didn't abandon furs. No interesting so tell me with the last few minutes that we have um what do you think about what do you think about when you reminisce and you reflect about those times the, the good part of the times forgetting the demise stuff um because you know uh, i saw it in in david and my family and my grandfather and, and great uncle you know before david just like you with your parents and so that was like a really special time in in retail and um and, well, it was, and merchandising it was i mean i took i became uh president of the company and and in 69 70 we were doing about 32 million i took it to 165 million which today would be a, a billion six i mean it, you know it's time, 10 times 
that's the value of the dollar. Um, and we expanded all over. We were in Arizona. We were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were in uh, Houston, Midland, Amarillo, Dallas, uh, and a catalog store. that was a separate store. So it was a really boom period if you just kept going. We were privately held. Neiman's was held by a public company, and they were all over the country. So they could survive with their out-of-Texas, out-of-state stores. Chicago, all the rest of them did very well during that period when we were collapsing. You know, one man's meets another man's poison. Right. And uh, it's a whole other story. But it was a, a, a very unique era of launching new product, of uh, what turned out to be the uh, youth quake, uh, a youth boom, uh, all kinds of innovation, new music, new everything. And just post-Vietnam, tailed off, uh, and then ultimately... Uh, Along came other aspects of this. The country became over mauled. Um, internet came along. I mean, today, Neiman's, Nordstrom's, and Sachs, all three, if I'm not wrong, um, each have at least 30% of their business uh, on, on the online. But the problem is they're returning stuff all the time because it doesn't fit necessarily. The three things that they still don't have right, that we could never get right in the catalogs, fit, fabric, and color. And so those three things, uh, you have to see the garment. Yeah, that, and I would add the fourth being being able to interact with the item. Correct, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, that was the era, uh, I would say, uh, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. And uh, everybody was, uh, let's put it this way, when it was just like the little girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead, when it was good, she was very, very good. When she was bad, she was hard. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great way to wrap up for our time today. Wow. Wasn't that something? I told you. A special time in fashion retailing that I was fortunate enough to catch the end of. So, if you liked what you saw, stay on the lookout for my documentary, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier, coming soon. But, if you want some preview sneak peeks, head on over to, where else, at Cranky Old Filmmaker on YouTube and check them out. And before you go, please subscribe, like, and share. And join us next time for another episode of the Cranky Old Filmmaker Show podcast. I'm Scott Hunter. Goodbye for now. And as always, don't let the smile fool you. <laughs>